Hello and welcome to the Chaston Centre. I'm Karen Chaston and today we're talking about the most amazing thing with my most amazing guest who I'm going to introduce right now, Alan Stevens. Welcome, Alan. How are you? Pretty good. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for the invitation. I really feel that you do not require much introduction, but for all the people, and I'm sure there's not many in the world that haven't met you, can you please tell everyone what you do? Well, I'm a profiling and communications uh, specialist. And by the way, thank you for the uh, for the, uh, for putting this together. You know, what I do is I help people to build stronger relationships, and I do that by teaching them how to read each other. First of all, know themselves, read the other person, and then know how to change the way that they like to be spoken to to match the way the other person needs to be spoken to. And I do that through your facial features that tell me your personality. And then uh, when I'm talking to you, I've got your body language and expressions that tell me, have I read you right? Is there something emotionally going on? And yes, are you telling me the truth? But I use that portion of it not as a lie detector, but as a truth seeker. Ah, was it the show Lie to Me? Is that what you would be doing? That would be part of it. Paul Ekman was the uh, advisor behind that show and he was a man who did all the research on the micro expressions. And he was, his group was one of the first ones that I did some training with. So expand on micro, like micro expression. So what sort of thing is that? Because I'm, I'm a very expressive person, right? Um, so, so tell me on me, what would it be that you would like to zoom in on? Well, the first thing, the micro expressions are, are fantastic for that, knowing whether you've connected with the person and knowing what's going on emotionally. Yeah. But before I even start there, you've got to have the foundation in place. And the foundation includes, it's like building a house. You don't put the roof on between, until you put the foundations in place. Yeah. Your facial features tell me your personality and very quickly how they work. If you lift weights, you're going to build your muscles in your body. We also know everything we express, uh, feel inside, we express outwardly. So you put that together. When you're sitting and concentrating, you're going to pull expressions on your face while you're working. And if that's the way that you concentrate all the time, you're going to create ridges and crevices on your face. And that gives away your personality. So, I so just that, the, the tongue hanging out when you're concentrating, what's that about? The what, sorry? The tongue hanging out when you're concentrating. <laughs> I notice I do that and my grandson does it. And it's really interesting to watch. And everyone's got their mannerisms. Yeah. But the whole thing is that those mannerisms will add to it as well. Because if I may, if I'm looking at you, the high cheekbones tell me that you're an adventurous type person. So I know that if I'm talking to you, I'm going to, if I'm introducing something new to you, I'm going to introduce it in a way in which it's exciting. It's a new uh, 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 idea or something you're going to be able to get out there and do. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I know that you've got a dry wit. Well, I know that because we spent a lot of time together. But before that, just your photograph tells me that you have a dry wit. So I know any conversation that I have with you, I'll throw stuff out, you'll throw it back, and it's quite lively and, and jovial. The person with the opposite trait is a little bit more fussy, and they may sit here what I say and take it the wrong way. And so I'm therefore it's a reminder to me just to be a bit more careful about the way I speak to those people. But first of all, there is no right or wrong trait. Every trait has an upside, and every trait has a downside. The more the upside, the more the downside is going to be triggered under stress. So if I understand oh. that, I then know how to set the environment up so the other person doesn't get triggered. We therefore have a lot more rapport and therefore a much better relationship. Okay, so let's bring this into the workplace because I find this amazing because let's face it, the workplace is probably one of the most stressful places that we can ever find in this, in this world. Hopefully your, your home is not stressed. If it is, let's help to solve that as well. But let's work on the workplace today because you know, there are so many people who are who feel very challenged, who feel that no one has their back. So how can they turn things around so that we do create that team dynamics workplace? Okay, I'll always start at the top because the, the organisation is run by the leaders. And I always say to the leaders, look, if your staff are happy, they're going to be more productive. If they're more productive, you're going to make more money. And as I say, somebody who's not happy, your performance can drop by 70% if they feel like they're being bullied, 40% if they're watching somebody who is acting as though they're being bullied. So it's a lot of money you're losing. So the first thing is 
put your focus on your staff. As they say, if you put your staff first, they will then put your customers uh, first themselves. And that's how you look after your customers and they grow your business. So in doing that, and then you can work on your business because now the people who are working in the business for you, they're working with the customers. So that's the first place to start. So priority, make sure that you understand your staff and talk to them in the way that they need to be spoken to. Then you know where their strengths are. You know what tasks to give them that they're going to enjoy more and therefore be more productive. And if they're more productive and they're happier what they're doing, they're going to go home happier as well. And the other thing is also let your staff have conversations with each other about idle chit chat because the most successful businesses are the ones that have two thirds of the conversation are about what happened on the weekend. How are the kids? What's been happening in your life? Because this is where we build rapport with each other and we become a, a solid unit. But if you're just working on the work stuff, everybody's separated. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I can remember in my corporate life, one of the things that we did to bring our senior managers together and to be on board was for us all to actually spend a day in each other's jobs so that we mm. could understand exactly what they were doing. Because a lot of the time you just think you're in your own little world and you don't even think about everyone else. But we all require each other. You know, it's a chain of events that has to happen in order for that, that product to be sold. So how, yeah. how do you foster those relationships? You know, it, do you teach people to read everyone else's face? Yep. Everything from uh, their spouse, their children, to everybody else in the organisation. Knowing that th there are three uh, major uh, uh, rules that I have when it comes to reading people. There's about seven secrets, but the first three, know yourself, know where you are on the world scale, know how to read the other person and recognise where they are on the world scale, and then change the way you like to be spoken to to match the way that they want to be spoken to. In other words, tune your transmitter into their receiver. That way they understand you and you can build the, uh, those relationships. But as you were saying a moment ago, with the spending time in somebody's job for a day, yeah. it might be really frustrating when you do it because you think, oh, my God, I hate this work. But now you know the work that they like to do. So that's stuff that you don't like doing. You know who to give that to. And mm -hmm. they, they will then give you the stuff that they don't like doing that you like doing. And this is how you build your relationship stronger again. Mm -hmm. The more you understand the other person and also understand yourself, the more uh, you're going to be able to build strong relationships. So does our face tell us what people like to do or is it just from spending time with them that you get to know that? No, you can pick up, even in a young child, there are three areas I'm looking at. I'm looking at the sports, the hobbies and the careers. And mm -hmm. so as you're looking at a young toddler, for instance, I can already tell you what they're going to be like before they get to school. So when they do go to school, how they're going to fit into the classroom, whether they're going to fit in or not into the system. We also know what hobbies will suit them as well. But before they pick their final subjects, there's a lot more traits that are starting to develop on the face. And as they're developing, we can understand the things that they would like to do and therefore we can work out what careers will suit their personality. And before they pick their final subjects, not tell them what to do, but direct them to go and have a look at the job guide and check these particular jobs out and work it out for themselves. You're now giving them ideas on how to find what careers will suit their personality. Because how many people get told by their families, you should be this. They yeah. go to university, they put all that work in and study and hate that, but then they go and work in the career if they even get to the you know, doing the career. And they go, no, I don't like this. Mm. And so you waste all that time. But if somebody was able to say to you earlier on, your facial features are telling me that these are the things that you love to do, is that right? And they go, yes. And they go, right, here's a couple of jobs that may fit that. Go and check these out in the job guide. And the person looks at that and goes, yeah, this is what I love to do. Then they pick the subjects that are going to be required to do that work. They're more likely to be successful with that and enjoy the study. And then when they get their degree or uh, qualifications, whatever, they will then go off and work in that field. And if they're happier, then now they've got the career that matches their personality. They're happier in their work. They're more productive. Therefore, the company makes more money. They go home happier. And they're getting on better with their spouse because they're not going home and whinging about what happened at work and what they don't like about their work. Yeah. And they're happier as well. So everyone in the cycle is looked after. That is so true, Alan. I can remember meeting a guy years ago, probably about five, six years ago. He was a QC and he had achieved it. And I said to him, oh, wow, what a great career. You've done so well. He said, yeah, but I never wanted it. He said, I wanted to be a musician. 
My parents wouldn't let me. They made me go to law school. Sure, I succeeded, but my heart was never really in it. So imagine living your whole working life where your heart isn't even in it. You, know, you can imagine the impact that's had on your body and uh, your health because everything we think about, we create chemical reactions. And if they're negative thoughts, we're not happy, that's affecting our body. Yes, you do yep. need a pay job then because you've got to pay for your medication. Yeah, it, it just creates so much disease in your in your body. And it's so true. Your cells are vibrant just the way you are if you're getting out of bed, excited what we're about to do. And we always do that, don't we, Alan? We I certainly do. do. Yeah, exactly. So coming into the workplace, like how, how do you how do you work? Do you start with the leader or do you bring it down? Or what, what, which is your ideal way in, in the workplace to establish, you know, these long-term lasting relationships? Because that's what, at the end of the day, they do become your family in the workplace. That's it. Well, look, if we look at a, a dog, for instance, the tail wagging doesn't wag the dog. The dog wags the tail. And so mm -hmm. when you're going to an organisation, you've got to start at the top because your executives have got to know what's going on. They've got to have taken ownership of this as well because you can't go to the front line and say, hey, we want you to do this. We're going to work on these levels. And they look and go, the bosses aren't invested in this. Yeah. You know, you've got to lead by example. So as I say, a leader's job is to make themselves redundant. And that's by lifting other people up to do what they're doing yeah. so they can go on and do something else. And in doing that, you have to act by example. So I always say to the bosses, hey, this is what you need to understand, uh, first of all. Then we filter that down through the organisation to the front line. Because unless the front line can see changes in the leadership, that the leadership is actually applying themselves, they're not going to take on what you put in front of them. You know, I can address yeah. it and show it in a way in which, yes, I'll get, they'll be able to use it for their personal life. And therefore, they'll take it on from that but there'll still be that barrier between the work and home. We want to mm -hmm. remove that barrier because at the end of the day, there's no such thing as a business relationship. There, you know, No business talks to another business. People talk to people. So yeah. everything in life is not business to business or business to customer. It's human to human. And so you want the staff to realise that not only are they going to be able to use this in their personal life, they're going to use it in the business. We want the bosses to know that, they're all looking after their staff so their staff can go home and use that at home as well, which means they're going to be happier at home, which means when they come back to work, they're going to be happier. Mm -hmm. Everything's connected, and that's what a lot of people don't seem to realise. We isolate and say, here's a little silo, let's fix this. Well, how does that impact on everything else? And you need to step back and have a look at that. And let's face it, the owners of the business should be the visionaries who can actually step back and see all of that. So we yeah. have to start with them. Yeah. So when we learn how to tip, to talk to people, like their 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 preferred is is it what, what's the right word? Their preferred listening style, be spoken to style. What's the word? How they oh, oh it's just simplified to how they like to be spoken to and how they like to be treated. It's not okay. a case of treat others as they you would have them treat you. That's right. Okay, when it comes to being respect and things like that, but I always say treat others as they would have you treat them. And that's why speaking to them in the way that they want to be spoken to, tune your transmitter into their receiver, as I say, you know, treat them in the way that they want to be treated. So let's give them an example of that, okay? So uh, like looking at each other, right? Obviously, we're quite different. We look quite different. Um, so do you want to give an example for people who are listening? Well, I know that, uh, you know, you're analytical. When you uh, receive information, you like to analyze How do you know that? This is in the exposure of the eyelids. Now, we've got it small on screen here, and yeah. also you've got your makeup on, but it looks like the, the, the what we call an epithelial fold. The eyelashes go up under that little fold. Yeah. That's somebody who's analytical. When you look at somebody and there's no fold there at all, they close their eyes, they open them back up again, and there was no eyelid going underneath. There was no fold of skin with the eyelid going underneath it. This is somebody who just wants the overview. Okay. So, being analytical, if you speak to somebody, how many times have you spoken to them and everything's been going fine and all of a sudden they've switched off? Yeah. You've given them, you've already given them the information they need, but now you're giving them extra information that you would have needed for yourself to make a decision. They've already made their mind up. And if you keep talking, you end up, as they say, you've, you've sold them in the front door and now you're walking out the back door and unselling them again. And so, so just no, by looking at the gap here and whether there's a fold, yeah, there's you a fold can there. tell, give them the big picture, 
or give them detail? Give them the detail. So somebody who just wants a big picture and the analysis I use, if they were on a mountain peak and there was another mountain peak and you said you have to go from that mountain peak to that one, all they want to know is where the bridge is. Yep. But the analytical person, you tell them that they will want to go down the mountain, picking up information, <laughs> go across the valley, pick up more, and before they go up the other side, work out whether they want to go there or not. <laughs> and so they will take longer to make a decision. So you can't rush them. Mm -hmm. If you're a, a big picture person, and you're talking to somebody who's analytical, you're trying to give the overview and the analytical person keeps stopping you and dragging you back and wanting more information about that item or the next item. Yeah. So with them, it's quite easy. Look, I've got a lot of information here and I know you're going to have a lot of questions. But so I don't forget any of this. But I want to put it on the table first. So I just want to give you an overview. Is that OK? Oh, the wow. analytical person talking to the big picture person. Look, there's a lot of information here, but I'm not going to give you all the information. I'll let you ask the questions that you want to ask. But if there's something there that you haven't asked, is it all right if I tell you that then? So that person now knows they're going to be spoken with. They're not going to be not talked at. Yes. And it puts but isn't that a good way for every to speak to everyone, whether you know that or not? Is Sorry? given the big picture, and the, isn't that a good way to speak to most people? Given the mm -hmm. overview, and then go into the detail if they so choose it. Yeah, but frame it up first, because if you go to the 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 overview with somebody who's analytical, and they're cr very critically analytical, and depends on a combination of their other traits as well, because not one trait defines you. We need to understand each trait, but then we look at how they the traits come together. And that, that's how the personality is created. So if you've got somebody who's got what I call a mental motive, needs all the, look at all the possibilities first. They've got a high detail concern. They're analytical. They're going to want a lot of information. And getting them to make a decision is going to take a long time. And mm -hmm. so you, if you know that, you don't know not to rush them. You know that they can preempt things. And you can, you've pre-framed the conversation before you start. And that way they understand. You've actually got a, a verbal contract at that point. So if they go outside that contract and say, hang on, remember I said I was just going to give you the overview and then you could uh, ask all the questions later on because I don't want to forget anything and that's important to me and that's got to be important to you too. And they go, yes, yeah. you've got the contract back again. And then you go back, well, here's a big overview. Now, go for it. Ask me every question you want to ask. And you okay. let them go for it. I love that. I love that. So I can see that like with dealing with customers, like training your staff to understand this and so that when they are face-to-face -face with customers, they can, they won't just have one style that no. this is how I serve customers and that's it. That's exactly right because, well, if I've got a couple there, for instance, and I, I had one where most people would think that the man would be always worrying about the money and the woman would be worried about the service and everything else. But I was talking to uh, one couple, it was the other way around. Now, they had just bought a car earlier on. And I said, well, you guys had an uh, argument. Did, you didn't buy it straight away, did you? And they went, no, no, we, went, we argued about it. We went back several times. And I said to her, look, I can see that your, your husband, you know, when he got in the car, he felt great. He wound the window down. He adjusted the seat. He sat in there. He shut the door and looked out. And it was on the outside. It was, hey, look at me. And on the inside, inside boom, boom, you know, like a little boy. <laughs> And she went off in a tirade about how every time they go shopping, she has to keep pulling him back because he spends all this money. And I yeah. said, well, that was the problem. I said, the salesman only spoke to him. And she said, yes. And I said, well, you're the one who is you know, looking for the value. So it was important to you to know that the, the car was well priced. Its running costs were economical. And in particular, all the stuff that your husband wanted to put on the car was what was the value of that? Like the spoiler, the idea of that is it's aerodynamic design to push the car down, tighten the, the grip on the road so less wear and tear on the tyres, more safety. And she went and I said, and the running costs, therefore, also improved as well. And the resale value. And she said, oh, if you'd been the salesperson, I would have bought it straight away. And so <laughs> I said, I would be talking to you about the value and I'd be talking to him about how it looked, how it felt and what people would think about it and everything else all the service that he was focused on. And then I'd relate back to her. Well, that stuff that your husband wants, this is the value you're going to get out of having that on the vehicle. Wow. That's incredible. Just from you teaching people how to just read their face, there's nothing else. Is, is it the way they walk up to you as well? Is is, it, is that as well or is it just mainly for the well, face? When they walk up, first of all, you've got their emotions because everything you feel inside you express outwardly. 
So if you're feeling sad inside, you're not going to have your cho- shoulders back and you know chest out, yep. standing erect. You're going to be bent, bent over. But the other thing too is that how much space does the person need? And this one, if you look at someone straight at you, you look at the gap between the eyebrow and the eyelash. If you've got a large gap, like on yours, it's not that when you're looking straight up through the vertically through the pupils. Yeah. I'm looking at the size of the iris, the coloured section of the eye. And then I'm looking okay. at how high the eyebrows are up here. Okay, there's not a lot. Okay. Now, there's not much on yours and there's very little on mine as well. Mm-hmm. The bigger the space, the more space that person needs. And if you think about it, when in fear and surprise, the eyebrows go up, we pull back from the person, they pull back from us. It's an indication that people aren't comfortable, they need space. Yeah. So someone with high set eyebrows, just naturally high set at rest, this is somebody who... It's not that they're not friendly, it's they're more discerning. They like to check people out and work out who's safe to be around and who's not safe to be around. So if you step too close to them when you meet them for the first time, they're not going to be listening to anything you're saying. They're going to be you know, worried about the fact that they feel uncomfortable you've invaded their space. So with oh, them, yeah. I that walk makes up so them. much sense. Yeah, I because I do that. I, I know I invade people's space. I think they get used to it, but I can remember you telling me this years ago and you actually walked people over to the bar to get another drink <laughs> through moving closer to them. <laughs> well, this particular uh, one, well, I bring people out on stage and I'll have somebody with a high set eyebrows and I'll just stand that little bit close to them and they'll just move away. I'll stand a bit yes. close and I'll move away again. But in this particular one, the, the gentleman was much taller than me. He was six foot six, yeah, almost a foot taller than me. He has a very affable trait, so he was comfortable standing close to people. He was right next to me. And yep. so every time, the only facial feature I could see was really up his nostrils because I had to bend back so far. All right. And we were having a conversation, but I realised that if I'd said anything, it would have broken the conversation. And the bar was on the other side of the room, tables in between us, so I nodded, turned my body slightly sideways, started moving slowly, but nodding and responding to him. He followed me. Yeah. When we got to the bar, it was the barman who interrupted our conversation by saying, what would you like to drink, gentlemen? Now, once we had the drinks, then I was able to hold it out in front of me so he couldn't stand that close to me because he would have been up against a glass. So that's how I got my space back. But the only reason I needed that space is because the difference in our heights. Uh, If it had been my height, I wouldn't have had a problem with it. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's that's so good to know no, because it's not just one size fits all and it no. is about learning this. So we're running out of time as always. I could talk to you all day long because you're so interesting. So where like, where can people find you and, and what is the number one advantage, like apart from what we've discussed, of why this is so important for every human to understand? And why isn't it taught in schools? Yeah. Well, the most important thing is, you know, as I said, the first uh, thing it was understanding yourself. If you yeah. know your traits, and by the way, every trait's got an upside and every trait's got a downside. Yeah. I've got that some great traits, but they're also doozies when it comes to relationships and other things. If yeah. I understand the downside of my traits, I know how to set my environment up so that I have dominion over my traits. They don't control me. That's the very first thing. Once I got that, I start living much happier. And therefore, yeah. the connections I have with people without doing anything else, they're improved. Mm-hmm. And the way people can find out more about this, if they come to my website, which is alanstevens.com.au, go yeah. to the uh, success story page and I'll see a lot of examples in there where other people uh, get that um, get the results they've got. But it's alan, A-L-A-N, and stevens, S-T-E-V-E-N-S.com.au. But if they put the forward slash after the A-U and the word free, F-R-E-E, that will redirect to my training platform and there's a free course there that they can have a go at, learn a couple of the traits and go and test them for themselves. At the end of the yeah. day, you don't know how good something is. Anybody can talk and as you know, I can talk all day, but uh, the only way you'll know whether it's uh, right, go and test it for yourself. That's amazing, Alan. And, you know, I, I, I've, I've been touching on this for a long time. I really do need to deep dive into it more because I do use it, but not as much as I certainly could. And, but I just love it. It's so interesting. But I have to say, since knowing you, um, all of my relationships have improved, and that is on you as much as it is on me. But it, it, does, it does make life easier when you know how to talk to people or with people as opposed to at them. 
it does make a complete difference. And it's, you know, it's up to us to change our style. It's not up to trying to change someone else. It's it's only us who, who we can change at the end of the day. Yeah. So why isn't this in schools? Oh, mainly because I think originally psychologists had a system called phrenology, which were bumps on the head being serial killers and things like that. You know, it was about character. And it's still stuck with that idea. But I've found that uh, well, we're talking about the facial features, which is personality, which is completely different. Personality is how somebody likes to think and process. Character is what they're thinking about and processing. Okay. Two different things. But um, uh, my youngest student at the moment is my 13-year-old granddaughter. She's now mm -hmm. become my business partner, which is my st first student at the age of 11. We're putting some cards together, flashcards with pictures on the front, the trait we're looking at on the front, on the back, it will have what that, how to read the trait, what it means, and how to talk to the person. So we've been trying to get into schools through the teachers. Well, we're getting it through the schools through the kids. And let's face it, yeah. they're the ones that are going to lead the way. Yeah, that's amazing, Alan. And I, I just know it'll make such a difference. But yeah, imagine if a, if a teacher knew how to talk to this child as opposed to another, and not this is my teaching style, and that's it. You know, those kids who are being left behind wouldn't be left behind because they would know that they didn't understand. What well, I've got uh, clients who are still doing testimonial videos for me 10 years later where okay. I've given them information, they've taken it to the schools, the teachers have put it in place, they've been able to reduce the medication their children are being on, others who have just had uh, the regular kids but their relationships are so much stronger. As I said, you yeah. talk to somebody in the way they need to be spoken to, everything changes. Yeah. And it's very it so, much the same with children. Yeah. So would this take bullying away? Would it, would it enhance it? Yeah, okay. well, one boy I trained, he was 15 years old at the time. I asked him how he was using it. He said he was uh, using it to profile the other uh, students. And I said, well, how's that going? He said, I now understand them. And I said, and what's it, that understanding giving you? He said, tolerance. Oh. Because bullying comes from not understanding. You educate, yeah. people understand somebody. They don't want to uh, bully them anymore. Oh, I love that. So this is one of the reasons why I want to get into the hands of the kids because picking on bullies, they became bullies because they got bullied somewhere down the track. So all you're doing is persecuting them further and creating an additional problem because they'll find another yeah. way of getting to you. That's how cyberbullying came about. We stopped yeah. it in the playground or reduced it there and it came out in cyber. So the way to change that is to improve the communications and through the understanding first of all. I love that. Patience and tolerance, that's what you're creating in the world. Isn't that amazing? It's something I never had as a kid. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure that's my whole lifelong goal, patience and tolerance. I think I was told that very, very well on in my journey. But, and I am getting better. I am definitely getting better. Thank goodness. <laughs> well, Alan, thank you. As always, this has been very enlightening and I just love talking to you. Is there anything else that you would like to say to anyone who is watching today? Because this can be used anywhere, professionally, personally, you know, even just to get to know yourself better, you know. And as you said, to understand the shadow side of your traits as well as the enlightened side of your traits. That's it. Well, as we said, it's 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 the foundation of everything we do in life, relationships. So it can be used everywhere in your, in your life itself. But I always like to point out to people, you'll hear about this stuff and you'll either love it or you'll be doubting it. I always say to people, the most important thing you'll ever learn is the next thing you learn after you think you know everything. So keep an open mind. Look at everything, test it and trial it for yourself. That's why I have that free course for you. But at the same time, Everything we do for ourselves dies with us, but what we do for others and for the community isn't always will be eternal. So mm -hmm. by just working on yourself to become the best version of yourself impacts on everybody else as well. So looking after yourself is not being selfish, it's being selfless because we're always going to be interacting with other people whether we like it or not. That's just life. I totally agree with that and I think that is a perfect way to end our conversation today. Thanks, everyone. Reach out to Alan, alanstevens.com.au. I am sure that your life will never be the same after you chat with Alan. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.